We continue our journey through Lent as we step inside the heartbreaking story of saying goodbye to friends. We put ourselves in the picture of Holy Week so that we might take a closer look and let the ancient story open us to listen to one another and treasure each other, all equal and precious in the eyes of God. Jesus' words at the Last Supper were shocking to those in attendance. His words can seem familiar, even comforting to us, because we hear these words every time we have communion. But at that moment of their utterance, they were anything but usual. This week, we enter the scene of that Last Supper, long enough to get a grasp of the shock that would have rippled through Jesus' friends. Partaking of body and blood, not kosher. A Lord washing feet like a servant? Unbelievable. Breaking bread with the enemy? What? But Jesus knew his time was up, and it was time for the disciples to get the message, even if it came in a shocking way. Love one another as I have loved you, by serving, forgiving, freeing, communing, becoming one with God. Let us pray together the prayer of confession. Sometimes we just aren't paying attention. We keep our heads in the sand when we really need to attend to difficult situations or the needs of your people. Forgive us, O God. Guard us from distancing ourselves and help us to care for what's right in front of us. You entered our story through Jesus. Now help us to enter fully into the story of your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven, as we silently confess what we need to let go of our regrets and sins and lamentations. Know this, our lives contain continual opportunities to be in humble service to friends and strangers. You are forgiven and freed, encouraged and loved by a God who wants you to live fully. Amen. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table took off his outer robe and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel that had, was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, You do not know now what I am doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, you will never wash my feet, Jesus answered. Unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, One who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is entirely clean. And you are clean, though not all of you. For I knew who was to betray him. For this reason he said, not all of you are clean. After he had washed their feet and put on his robe and had returned to the table, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord and you are right for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher have washed your feet and also ought to wash, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. Very truly, I tell you, servants are not greater than their masters, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. My master's banquet hall upstairs was booked for the night, and the time had arrived for this evening's group to come for the banquet. All was prepared accordingly to their wishes, and I was ready with the water and basin, as I always am. Years ago, my parents had given me 
to the owner as collateral for the debt they owed him. But things did not go well for them, and the debt had never been paid. And so I worked to pay it off. Roman law says that some days I could be a freed person, but I will never again have the full rights in society like those who would have never been slaves. It is a mark for life. I kept my head down and do what the other master asks, because legally he has the right to punish, abuse, and humiliate him. Me. I've witnessed it happen to others. Right now, I have no rights. So there I was with the bull, just waiting for the go-ahead to start. It would be the honored guest first, of course. And I knew which one that was by where he was seated. This was all, this was all protocol. Everyone has a place according to status, status. Um, when he showed up, I recognized him and remembered the stories I had been hearing about his teacher. He was saying things that were really upsetting those invested in the system of, st of status, saying things like, The last shall be first. My friend who serves in the kitchen had to tell me to stop staring. I couldn't imagine a word like he described. And then he came right up to me and took the basin of water from my hands. He took my servant's towel and wrapped it around his waist and knelt, telling Peter to come sit down. This was going to be no ordinary night, and I realized my life, my view of myself, and my station in life was never going to be the same. Rock of Ages, clear for me, let me hide myself in thee, let the water and the blood from thy wound did sideways flow. begins with the sharing of a meal. Jesus tells the disciples to go and prepare the meal for him, to prepare the space where they will share the Passover supper. And he sets them out to do that, and when they start and are sharing that meal, Jesus sits down at the table with them, and he picks up a loaf of bread, he takes it, and he blesses it, and he breaks it, and he shares that loaf of bread with each of them, saying, this is my body broken for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. And then after supper, he took a cup of wine. He poured it and blessed it and gave it to his disciples, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant. My blood shared for you. Sounds like a bunch of vampires, doesn't it? Jesus tells them, I mean, because picture this. They haven't been practicing communion their whole life, right? They haven't heard those words over and over and sense the power and beauty and the grace present in that little bit of bread and that little sip of wine. They're hearing it for the first time 
and he's telling them to eat his body. Who? And to drink his blood. I mean, what do they make of those words, those actions? What is it he wants them to know about this meal? And maybe in that moment they didn't get it. Maybe they heard the words, but they weren't sure what was going on. But then they remembered. They remembered and shared it with each of their fellow followers of Jesus. They shared it and shared it so that down through the generations, we have shared that story of a simple loaf of bread and a cup of wine and the power behind them to bring us together as a community. In the Gospel of Luke, that portion of Monday Thursday, that portion of that night ends with a dispute among the disciples about who should be the greatest. Who should be the one? You know, the it pastor, the one who everybody turns to, that one. Who should be the greatest? And he said to them, that's what the people around us are worried about. Who is the greatest? Who has authority over another? Who is the one that can bring all the benefits and be the greatest benefactor? But that's not us. That's not what I've been trying to teach you all these many years. That is not who we are called to be and what we are called to do. That isn't us. That isn't who I want you to be. For to follow me, to be the greatest, I'm inviting you to be a servant. To follow me, I'm asking you to be like the littlest one. I'm asking you to be the one who serves. And Jesus wants to make sure that this teaching that he has given them over and over again that they understood, and so he repeats it that last night in the Gospel of Luke. But we know that that's what he's calling us to do. Because we've heard this story, and we've heard the other parts of this story. We've heard him tell his disciples in Mark 10, you know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers lord it over them. And the great ones are tyrants over them. But it's not so among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you must become a servant. And then he gets to the hard part, right? Jesus continues by insisting that his followers are not simply to be servants. Whoever wishes to be first among you must be a slave of all. I bet he shocked them with that language of slavery. The Gospel of John wanted to make that, that idea of service and servanthood and being a slave crystal clear to the people reading and hearing the story of Jesus. And so on Monday, Thursday, instead of sharing communion in the Gospel of John at that moment, Instead of sharing communion, Jesus gives us a different act, a different symbol. That night, Jesus takes the bowl and takes a towel and he kneels down at the feet of the disciples and washes their feet. That just wasn't done. In the house where they were staying, he would have been considered the most important person there. And the most important person had their foot washed. They didn't wash others' feet. But Jesus wanted to make a point. 
He wanted to talk to them about what it meant to be a servant. And so he showed them. He showed them that I'm asking you to take on this role that you don't want to take on. Because it's the lowliest role. It's the role given to the lowest person in the house. It's the role given to the slave. And that's who I'm asking you to be. I'm asking you to choose to be a slave. To choose to be a servant. But not choosing to be a slave and a servant to a master. I'm asking you to choose to be a servant and a slave to God. I'm asking you to give up your freedom to God. And when you give up your freedom to God, you will make sure that no earthly master, no one will be a slave. He's asking us to do something really difficult in this passage. He's asking us to wash another's feet. Do you see the symbolism there for what we've all been encouraged to do for the last two weeks? We've been told that every time we leave the house, every time we touch our face, every time we have gone anywhere, when we walk back in, the first thing we are supposed to do is wash our hands. And not just a cursory wash. No, we're supposed to wash our hands for 20 seconds. Singing happy birthday, not once, but twice. Or you could do, I will survive. Or hallelujah. Or you could do the hallelujah chorus. Just so long as when you're washing your hands, you are washing them so thoroughly, so completely, that that virus does not enter the house with you. We've been lost asked to wash our hands. But we're asked to wash our hands not necessarily for ourselves, not only for ourselves, but for everyone around us. So that if we're living with people who are in that category of those that will be most affected by this virus, that when we wash our hands and when we come in from the outside, we're saying we care about you. We want to make sure you're safe, that you're protected, that this virus doesn't get you. When we wash our hands, we're saying that we care about those around us. That we care and try to stop the progress of this horrible virus. As I was thinking about this washing of our hands, I put on my t-shirt. Now, you know I don't normally wear t-shirts to church, right? I'm the dress girl. I love to wear dresses. I've always loved to wear dresses. But I got this t-shirt for when we were having Dr. Seuss Day with the Building Black Preschool. And when I looked online, they had all sorts of t-shirts, but this one is the one I want. Because this one comes from my favorite story. And it says, unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better. It's not. It's from Dr. Seuss's book, The Lorax, which is one of my favorite Dr. Seuss books. Now, if you've never heard the story about the Lorax, there's this little boy who is wandering through this wasteland where all the trees are gone, all the grass is gone, all there is is smog everywhere, the sky is dirty, there's no plants or animals, there's no trees, no birds, no life. And as he's walking along, he comes to this big rock that says, unless. And he wants
wants to know about it. So he asks the person who knows about this sign to tell him the story. And so the onceler tells him about how a wagon pulled into town and saw these amazing truffle trees. See, the truffle trees. And he thought, we can make some wonderful stuff with that truffle tree. And the Lorax kept having conversations with this man, this creature, who wanted to use those truffle trees. Use them all up. And so every time more truffle trees got cut down, he would come up to the man and say, you know, the birds can't sing now because the smog is so thick. These creatures can't eat because there's no food for them and they're hungry. You need to stop. But they didn't stop. They continued that harvest of the truffle trees until there was nothing left. And then they all left and left behind this barren wasteland. And the Wetzler tells him that before the Lorax left for the very last time, he left two things. That big rock with the word unless and a seed. And that seed was a seed for growing truffle trees. Unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better. Not. I wish I could say to you, if we just became servants, we could wipe out this virus. I wish I could say to you that if we took on the role of service and if we washed our hands 20 times a day, that things would get better. I can't make that promise. Things are going to be hard and they're going to be hard for a while. But even when they're hard, We know what we've been called to do as Christians. We've been called to become the servant, to wash our feet or our hands, to go to the places of trouble and danger, although really stay home and wash your hands. And even though we can't go out, even though we can't go to see our friends and our family, even though we cannot physically be where they are, we can still pick up the phone and call them. We can call them and just say, how are you? I was watching our church service. And Pastor Charlene said, that we needed to take care of each other. We needed to say and ask, how are you? And so I picked up the phone and called you. What if you did that to every person in this congregation that you normally pass the peace to? What if you made a point of dropping them a text, an email, an old-fashioned letter, or picking up the phone and just said, how are you? I've been thinking about you. We may not be able to physically go out and fix this problem, 
to stop this pandemic. But we can do our part. We can wash our hands and we can remind ourselves that Jesus was in a similar spot. Him and his disciples were gathered together and he knew that this would be the last time he was with them. He washed them. Unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better. It's not. Amen. What a friend we have in Jesus All our sins and griefs to bear What a privilege to carry Everything to God in prayer Oh, what peace we offer invite you to take a deep breath in and a deep breath out. Breathe in and breathe out. Holy One, how are we to pray in these times of pandemic when country after country imposes stringent stay-at-home orders, when schools and restaurants and businesses are closed and all public gatherings are banned? All we can do is breathe. Holy One, how are we to pray when fears start to consume us? When we can't shake our worries about our own safety and the safety of those we love? When we are daily reminded of the risks taken by healthcare workers and grocery clerks and delivery people and emergency service providers and all other essential personnel? breathe. Holy One, how are we to pray when the numbers of COVID-19 illnesses and death keep rising? Breathe. Holy One, how are we to pray when we lost our job, when the family around us has lost their job? when our child so far from us has lost their job. Breathe. Holy One, how are we to pray when nearly every country in the world has insufficient tests, medical masks, respirators, ICU beds, when many people lack access to even basic medical care or can't afford it? When we know it would take but a single spark to make the epidemic run rampant among the homeless, in jail, in refugees camp, or among the many others in the world who simply can't take the basic precaution of frequent hand washing or social distancing because they don't have access to soap or running water or live in overcrowded conditions. Breathe. Holy One, how are we to pray when our prayer lives are so cramped by worries about the virus that we can barely take in the fact that there, are major, there was a major earthquake in Croatia, that the Great Barrier Reef in Australia has suffered another massive bleaching, when we know that there must be so much else going on in the world, both good and bad, that merits prayer? Breathe. Holy One, how are we to pray when we remember that you are always with us, 
that you are full of mercy no matter whether we are angry, frustrated, fearful, sad, or full of joy. When all we can do is breathe. 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 Breathe as we join together in saying the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This month's mission is to provide Easter dinner for the Hinkley Area Food Pantry families. We have been collecting soup and beans and corn and cake and scalloped potatoes and frosting and candy and rice and French's onions and pineapple. And we've been collecting money to purchase hams. We're creating, we're packing for 35 families. I invite you to give generously to our monthly mission and to give generously to your St. Paul's family that we may continue to be a beacon of hope and calmness, that we may continue to provide care and peace to those that we serve. Loving God, we ask you to bless this food, that it may nourish the body and souls of our neighbors. Your personal love was reflected in the kindness of Jesus, who washed his disciples' feet. Make us willing to get our hands dirty in assisting others. Help us to discover joy in giving our time and money. We ask this for the sake of Jesus who came not to serve, to be served, but to serve. Amen. This season, we're putting a frame around a bit of life. We section off a scene and we look into a face to see what we can see, to know what we can know, just as we have done with the art and story today. Zoom in your focus on the art and story of life all through the week. The divine artist offers us such poignant beauty each day in our own stories, in the stories around us, in the heartbreak and pain and joy and awe of a simple moment turned significant. That's what happens when we put a frame around it. We zoom in for an existential close-up and search for clues for living this life with more attention and intention. May you be blessed by the sacred frames that surround the moments of your life that you dare not miss. And if nobody told you today that I love you, remember that God loves you and always will, that Jesus loves you and always will, that I love you and always will. And may you act on that love. Amen. <laughs>